some of you um, may or may not know, I was in Nicaragua over the summer. I flew in um, July 3rd and then uh, was back here September 1st. So I was there for a good chunk of the summer. Uh, near the end, I went and visited my family in Ontario. But uh, yeah, so I just wanted to share about that. And some of you actually may also remember um, when I spoke briefly before I went, there was a couple of challenges regarding housing that had come up on the other side. And uh, so I wasn't sure where I was going to be staying <laughs> when I was arriving in Nicaragua. Um, but that did work itself out. They did like a full-on clean, pulling out panels because there was mouse issues and mold issues. Well, rat issues actually. Um, so they were like pulling out panels from the ceiling and wiping it down. And then I had also shared um, a little bit about a truck that uh, my friends had. And that is still a process that's happening. Um, I know when I talked to them yesterday, they're still hoping to be able to, because they talked to the uh, mayor, the Alcadia, um, as they would say on the island. Um, they talked to the mayor and he's very interested. So it sounds like they're gonna try to build some, hopefully in the future, build some dome homes. So just wanted to kind of catch you up on that. And if you ever <laughs> happen to think about it, definitely keep them in your prayers. So um, anyway, so Nicaragua, what I want to do, and I want to have my notes here so that I can stay on track. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of themes in my journey, um, sort of the theme of what happened before I went to Nicaragua, what happened while I was in Nicaragua, and then what's happening after Nicaragua. So, um, I'll start off with at the beginning of this year, 2019, um, I just kept having the, the very popular scripture, powerful scripture from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that was coming up for me. And that was something that came to my mind uh, back in January. And, um, and it was shortly after that that I was invited to go to Nicaragua. And I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, it's like for two months. And it's just like, you know, I got to see if, you know, I can get the time off work and, you know, sublet my part. And there was just a lot of concerns that I had. And so then I just felt like God kept reminding me Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And um, I'm just... And actually, um, even the entire chapter of Proverbs 3, I won't read it all, but um, just the entire chapter is just been... All right, um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And uh, so it was just like all of a sudden, it's like this... This verse that I memorized as a child that I heard many times, it's like all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, God, what does this really look like? And, you know, I started to do a little bit of a word study and, and you know, like just acknowledging God and just recognizing that part of that was just acknowledging the character of God. You know, like just acknowledging, you know, and we were saying that this morning, just acknowledging his faithfulness and acknowledging his provision. And, you know, there were times where I was just like, well, are you really gonna provide for this? <laughs> you know, and sometimes it just looks different, but just acknowledging that, that God is, is with me, even though it may not look like that, you know, it's just like, he is faithful and he is good and, and, um, and he will cause growth for us. So um, to make a long story short, God did provide. Um, the first person I had to sublet, amazing fit, and then all of a sudden, last minute, for a very good reason, she had to cancel on me. So I was like, okay, you know, like, is it going to be easy to find someone that wants to sublet for two months? And then the second time around, God literally gave me a choice of two amazing people. And I had to choose, well, who, who you know, because they both would have loved to have stayed in my place. And so I'm like, oh, wow, God, <laughs> you're giving me a choice here. So anyways, uh, I found a 
really great tenant. Um, it was a blessing for her to be in my place, and it just blessed me, and it just, it worked itself out. The provision for me to go to Nicaragua, you know, the doors opened up, and uh, so I was just grateful. So, and I know the plan was that when I was going to Nicaragua, I would be helping my friends out quite a bit, but also helping out in the community. So, you know, that was good. Um, but as I arrived, well, actually, even a couple of weeks beforehand, just because of challenges like the housing challenge and stuff like that, I was beginning to, um, just something in my gut was telling me before I even got on the plane to go to Nicaragua, I'm like, something tells me this is going to be a challenging journey. <laughs> You know, so it's like, okay, well, God, I know you want me to go to Nicaragua, so I'm going. <laughs> so, um, anyways, it, it did prove to be challenging, and it did prove to be different than I anticipated. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go back to my notes here, so that I don't wrap the trail too much. Um... So um, when I arrived, um, I, I wasn't able to right away go and help out in the community. Um, the family that I was staying with, uh, my friend, she was facing some, some difficult challenges. And um, I just, you know, in that, you know, I just realized that things were just going to look different. And so I was, I was okay with that, you know, for the first little while. But um, there were some, just some hard situations um, that came up that just, I, I realized it was, just brought me to a place where I was um, basically counting down the days <laughs> to go back to Canada. And uh, so I was like, oh God, this, you know what's going on here and I, I just started to ask questions and and you know and just really wanting to you know have my time in Nicaragua you know I just wanted my heart and my attitude and the way I served you know just you know not that I had to do it perfectly but just I wanted my attitude to be one you know that was you know one that was like, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient to you in this. And, uh, and so I, you know, I just really found myself praying a lot and just with some close friends, just asking for some prayer and stuff like that through this. And, uh, you know, and still there was this little, I recognize this little attitude of, okay, God, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> you know, because I, I found myself having, which wasn't all, um, you know, it's not that I didn't mind it all, but I think it was just, I found going from a place where here in Canada, you know, as a single person, you can kind of do what you want, when you want, how you want, <laughs> and, and, you know, around a working schedule to having to, you know, help take care of children and help with household chores in a culture that's a little bit different. And um, there were definite highlights in it all, and I will share those. But um, the challenge is, you know, I just realized one day, you know, God just reminded me um, as I was praying, I just felt like he was like, Connie, who, who are you serving? Are you serving your friends or are you serving me? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that just really spoke to me, right? And, um, and then from Colossians 3, which I'm going to just open up to. And again, the entire um, chapter is just really spoke to me, but I'm just going to read a few verses from Colossians 3, 2 and 3. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then um, Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for man, um, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. 
the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And even in this, I just really felt God's encouragement. Like another time, I just felt like he was saying, you know, Connie, even though you might feel bad about things, I've seen you do 10,000 things right in Nicaragua. And I just went, wow. You know, it's like God's thoughts and ways are so much higher than ours. And it's like I went through my own discipleship training school, and it was just like, you know, something did change for me. You know, I still had my tough days, but like just remembering, okay, God, I am serving you in that. And there was mornings or afternoons or whatever, you know, whether I was hanging up laundry or sweeping the floor, or whatever it looked like, there was just moments where I just felt this song just rise up in my heart, and so I would just start singing it, you know? And so, so even in hard times, and, and it wasn't even for me, because I've done missions in third world countries, so it wasn't necessarily the rats or, or the, you know, the humidity or the mosquitoes or whatever third world countries have to do with you. I think it was just more, there was some situations you know, that other situations that just proved to be challenging for me, but it's like God just really brought encouragement. And another way that he did this is in Nicaragua, like here in Canada, you know, we often call or text each other and it's like, hey, is there anybody come on over? When can we have a coffee date? <laughs> well, in Nicaragua, they just, once they meet you, it's like their way of extending friendship is they just show up. <laughs> There they are, they just walk in, and, and that's the way they do it. So this one evening, I was really tired, was work, you know, doing dishes or whatever, and all of a sudden this, and I met some lovely locals there, and all of a sudden this one lady I got to know, Adalia, she walks in with three other women, and we're having a prayer meeting right now. <laughs> so we did, and, and with that, um, there was, um, there was five children in total there as well, and so the kids would kind of sometimes run in and just kind of, you know, sit and listen to the prayer time, and then they would also be just running around the house just having a grand time as, you know, the adults were, were praying, but, you know, the Holy Spirit just really rested on that, on that prayer time, and we all left just feeling encouraged, and I just felt like, you know, that was another moment where God just really ministered to different people and I met three women I had well two of them actually out of the four that I hadn't met before just beautiful women and and it also opened up an opportunity for me to go up to a local school and help out there and so so things look different than I thought but I saw God in it in many different ways and now I'm back here in Canada, and it, it took time to adjust, um, but um, I find myself still processing, because when B asked me last week to share, at first I was like, oh yeah, sure, and then a little later I'm like, you know, B, I don't know if I'm ready to share, <laughs> and uh, you know, I kind of talked to her about it, but she gave me some some good words of wisdom. She goes, you know what, that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's okay to still be processing stuff. And so so now after Nicaragua, I'm still processing, but it's just like, I know God's gonna give me some truth and revelation. And um, in this all, you know, it's like still Proverbs 3 and Colossians 3, um, you know, still, come up for yourself and come up for me and in Colossians 4 it says devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving and so there's just been a lot of scripture that has stood out for me and um, so I think that's really it for me. You know what I heard in Connie is a uh, testimony was a lot of divine interruptions. I think we have our things planned and we're doing dishes and we're doing this and we're doing that and all of a sudden God says, yeah, I've got something else planned for you. So Father, we're just going to pray for more divine interruptions for Connie's life. Thank you that you brought her back safely. Thank you, Father, that uh, even in the difficult times, the joy still held up inside her. And Father, we just 
Father, we just continue to pray for more of you in her life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Teresa's next. I keep calling these, I, I get these two mixed up all the time. I call Connie Teresa, Teresa Connie, but I think I got it right today. <laughs> Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Excuse me, please. What's that? That's good. That's good. There's more. I learned more French in the last six months than I did in my entire high school education. Sure. Uh, I was a. Uh, let me start again. I'm Teresa. <laughs> Je m'appelle Teresa. I just got back from uh, school of worship in Switzerland, in a little village there. French-speaking village. Um, the base there was bilingual, but I was uh, shocked at the amount of French that I found there. So I, uh, I joked frequently throughout the school that I got to do two schools for the price of one, the school of worship and the school of surprise French immersion. <laughs> uh, I was the only Anglophone in my class, so our classes were translated. Um, and there were uh, people in my class that did speak English, but they were quite shy to do so, and sometimes they just, quite frankly, didn't want to. Uh, so, it was a journey. Um, at the beginning of that school, um, they asked us to ask God a question. Uh, why, what does uh, God want to do for you during this time? And that was a great question, because I wanted to know that very much as well, especially since I realized that my French was going to be a struggle. I was like, why, why am I here? What am I, what am I doing here? And I felt like God said, I want to bring you out of hiding. Wow. And um, I was like, oh, are you sure about that? <laughs> but um, it was a real journey of... Uh, intimacy and uh, just times with God, just me and him, whether I was alone physically in a room or whether I was with a group of people that I may or may not uh, understand. Uh, so it was, it was a bit of a unique journey. I remember, remember the first night uh, we had a, once a week we had a community worship time. Um, which was bilingual, but also a lot of French. And I was, I thought, Lord, how am I going to worship you? I don't, I don't know French. And he said, stop. He said, listen, for my spirit. He said, you'll be fine. Come on. And uh, it just, as I was preparing like some notes today, which I'm not doing a very good job of following, <laughs> uh, I, just, I just realized that there were situations all along the way that, I didn't know what was happening, I didn't know what was going on, I didn't understand necessarily that we were leaving at 4 o'clock and we were supposed to meet downstairs in this room, not that room. But um, we don't need to understand what's happening in order to worship God. We just need to listen, stop, and listen to what His Spirit is doing, and then we'll be okay. Um, let me just check my notes here. I had always wanted to do a school of worship. I did my uh, discipleship training school with uh, Youth the Mission in 1994, fresh out of high school. And so I completed that, and I wanted to do a school of worship uh, right after that in Hawaii. And God said, no, I don't want you to do that. I said, yes, I'm doing that. And he said, no, I don't want you to do that. I said, well, yes, I think it's a great idea. He said, no, I don't. <laughs> So I finally gave in, and I didn't do any YWAM for over 23 years. Um, and some of you would know I did a School of Biblical Studies last year in Hawaii. Uh, and I thought, okay, now I'm going to do a School of Worship in Hawaii. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> so I came home um, without any intentions of doing more YWAM, and, and then God is sneaky sometimes. I don't know if you have experienced that, but I have. He's been quite sneaky in my life. <laughs> um, you know, maybe I'll work for a few months and then I'll go see my parents in Europe because they were going to go do some work with Youth of the Missions. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe. 
And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll visit a friend I met in Hawaii. She lives near Paris. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go do that. And then one day I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could just look up to see if there's any schools of worship in France. Why not France? <laughs> Uh, but there weren't any, but there was one in a little, a little Swiss village uh, a few hours from France, uh, which took me six months to say the name of that village properly. Uh, I, was co I was helped a lot to learn to pronounce it properly. <laughs> um, it was beautiful. I never, I never thought God would take me to such a place, ever. I really didn't think I would ever make it to Europe, even though I'd wanted to go there my whole life. never know <coughs> when God will fill a dream for you. You just don't. <coughs> and one of my co-workers said, man, I hope I get to travel someday. I said, you know, you never know. I got to see five different countries while I was gone. Some of them six days. One, one afternoon, I was in Amsterdam for an afternoon on a layover. Um, a uh, brief uh, stop in Dublin. Most of my time was in Switzerland. Uh, it's such a beautiful country with a, a really rich heritage. Um, so you just never know when God might uh, might do something special for you. Uh, our school covered a lot of topics um, from songwriting to team dynamics to practical aspects of doing worship together as a group, um, what it means to lead. One of our speakers uh, was from a church in the States, and uh, his worship team, teams, uh, they have a, quite a large church. They clean the toilets at the church once a month for part of their worship practice. And uh, I remember him telling a story of a lady who said, God called me to join your worship team at this church. And he's like, okay, great, come Saturday. Uh, bring your bring some scrubby clothes. And she's like, well, why? He's like, well, we're cleaning toilets this Saturday for practice. And she, and she never showed up. Uh, that wasn't her thing, I guess. But um, it struck me, like, worship, uh, it's not about me uh, at all. <laughs> it's not about, um, I mean, we do want to be good enough in what we do that you know, we're not distracting people uh, in the presence of God, but it's not about me or, or the talents that I have or what I think I can bring. Uh, it's about whether or not I want to serve. Do I want to serve the people that God has put in front of me? And um, I struggled a lot with tendonitis while I was there. Uh, it's slowly improving, but which meant I couldn't play guitar a lot or play piano because... Yep, my tendons were like, nah. -uh. So it was challenging for me. And then during my, uh, I did an eight week internship, and I was like, oh, I wish my arm was better, right? So I could like lead worship. And uh, I had a weekly coaching session with the leader of the school, and he had gone through something similar. His rotator cuff had been inflamed, and he had just gone through a couple years of just not being able to play his bass guitar. And uh, he said, what does it mean to you to lead worship? And uh, so for me, I learned it. It's if I can encourage someone to seek God, I'm helping to lead worship. And it doesn't matter where we are or what we're doing or what our role is, musical or not. We can lead each other in worship. And we can find God's presence in the small moments or the public moments or the private moments. Uh, of our lives, and that really stuck with me, because so often I feel like I have to do something. I'm, I'm not a great patient. I, I need to be doing, I need to be getting better or recovering. Uh, I always, my mom had foot surgery before I came home. I was there for a little bit helping her, and I, I always told her she wasn't a very good patient, because <laughs> she was supposed to keep her feet up. She's like, I'm tired of just sitting here. I want to get up, and I want to move around and do stuff, and, and I totally understand that feeling, and uh, but that's what does it mean to be worship? Can I? How can I encourage the person in front of me to find God in their situation? Because it's Him that we worship. 
it's who he is that inspires us to respond somehow with a hand raised or a song sung or just thoughts in our minds or a turning of our heart to think about what it is he wants us to see and what he wants us to feel and um, yeah so in my many times on my own in my room or out for walks uh, these are some of the things that were kind of uh, percolating in my mind I wanted to share a couple of, oh yeah, we, we did book reports, uh, we had to write a song each month and present it, uh, we had to prepare teachings, like 15 minute teachings, um, so they kept us quite busy, not as busy as SBS, anything after that is a dream and a rest. Um, there were two, uh, two ministry highlights that came to mind. Uh, one was um, in a little village called Vallée de Jeux, and there was maybe 10-ish people that came. It was just a worship night. And um, in the old days, the Swiss would light huge bonfires, like the wood would be stacked like this in TV style. And they would light fires uh, to let the other villages know that people were still alive and the village was functioning. And so when we were there, uh, it just seemed small. And then God just reminded me of that. He's like, I see the little fires that are burning around. And it's like, I think we need to, I need to remember that. <laughs> um, so the little fires were just as significant to him. And that, that small group of believers needed to know that God saw them. He saw that they were, they were trying to keep the fires burning. Um, and it was one of my most uh, favorite memories there. I had to lead a song in French. Thankfully, it was one I knew in English. So uh, the song was actually uh, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. You know, let the weak say, I am strong, let the poor say, I am rich. Um, it was really beautiful. And then my other favorite time was uh, singing at a kids camp. They had a week long kind of BBS, but there was 200 kids there. It was a lot of uh, noise and energy going on and I was part of the worship team for that. And so we sang, I don't know, 20 minutes or so uh, en français. Uh, so that was really fun. Uh, a lot of those kids didn't know God. You could see their faces, the ones to which uh, churchy things were familiar, and those to which they were, what is going on? Uh, but you could see over the week, like, their facial expressions changed. And you, I mean, I don't know what God did in their lives, but you can see that God was touching them. And again, I was struck by, I don't even know what I'm sing singing, but... We just have to open our mouths sometimes and do, do something <laughs> because God knows what he's doing. When he was touching them, whether I understood what I was saying or not, and by that time my understanding had grown some, <laughs> but uh, most of the time it was only because I looked it up on Google. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, right. oh, okay, 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 okay. So it's a, it's a good way to learn another language. And then another significant time for me during the school was right at the end when it was almost over and I was like, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go? Uh, I felt a bit purposeless before I left um, and I just was out of it. I did not want to return to that feeling. And in my mind, that feeling was associated with life here in Abbotsford. Um, so I asked God, I made some pretty uh, demanding requests. <laughs> it's like I got nothing to lose. Like, where do you where do you want me on this planet? Where where do you want me? Where is your purpose? Um, so I said I want two people to message me about a place to live in Abbotsford. I'm not telling the soul what I need <clears throat> because the lack of the market has just gone nuts, and to find a place to rent is challenging in Abbotsford. 
Um, so that week, two people messaged me. Oh, I said, I want good people. I said, people that I'm going to get along with, people that I don't have to worry about. Uh, I've had some interesting rental experiences in the past. So these two people, good people, emailed me, and I was like, okay, I'm going for more. <laughs> I was like, I want this person to email me about this specific topic and invite me to a conversation about that specific topic. And later that week, that person messaged me and said, I would like to have a conversation with you about this topic. And I said, okay. And yet something in me still wasn't quite sure. Uh, so two nights before I left, uh, I had a dream. In, in that dream, I was uh, in a vehicle on a highway, and I didn't know where I was going. And everything in the dream was black and white and gray. There was no color. And uh, we're driving along the highway, and we drive past this building, and in bright red and white was a Canadian flag. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And, you know, we kept going. And then this truck came, uh, was about to pass the vehicle that I was in, and I noticed it was red with a white, as a half-ton pickup truck, a red truck and a, a white canopy, and on the front was a Canadian flag. And in the dream I said, oh look, there's some Canadians. And the man in the truck that was driving, he slowed down to drive right beside us, and he, because he had heard me, and so he rolled down the window, and he said, yes, we are. And he introduced me to each person in the vehicle. And then he looked at me in the eyes and he said, and where are you from? And you know, sometimes you can like watch yourself in your dream. And I was like watching myself and I was starting to feel anxiety. What am I going to say? Where, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Is it Alberta where my parents live? Saskatchewan where I have other relatives? Is it somewhere in Europe? What, 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 where am I going to go? And in the dream, I, I sat up in my seat and I said, I am from Abbotsford. British Columbia, Canada. <laughs> and I woke up and I was like, okay, I'm going to Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. And I remember uh, standing at the kitchen at my mom's place. And uh, she was supposed to have her surgery six months down the road, but she got a call the day before I came home and she was to have her surgery that week. So it was good timing for me to be there. Um, and I remember standing at her sink still a little remorseful that I wasn't gallivanting around Europe somewhere. And, uh, and God said, you know, if I wanted you to be serving me there, you would be. So, but I actually want you to serve over here. This is where I want you to serve. And I was like, okay, done. So here I am in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I don't know what God wants to do here for me or in this place, but I know ever since I moved here about uh, 12 years ago, God really wants to do something in this city. It's just, it's never, it's never uh, left me. He wants his kingdom to come here. Mm -hmm. And um, so in closing, I'd like to share with you some of my homework. Uh, one of the songs that I wrote while I was there, um, I've been moving, starting work again, and what else have I done? Oh, car shopping, so my, my brain forgot my instrument this morning. Um, so I'll just sing it a cappella, um, but I'll tell you the words first. Um, kind of the first verse is, in my mind I was thinking about the sacrifices of the Old Testament, and then Jesus came, his ministry was about to begin. It's like the dawning of the kingdom of God on earth. It was like dawn was about to break. And then the second verse, um, you know, he dies, the curtain's torn, we can go in to the presence of God. Um, we can have holy communion with him, this is what I call the song. Um, and then the third verse was about um, his ministry. And so, so I thought it was interesting we had communion today. I wrote it with a heart to honor the traditions of Europe, the traditions that are even our new modern day traditions are rooted in these, these older ones, um, but also the heart that God wants his kingdom to come, and it shakes things up, like Jesus shook things up in his day. He changed the order of things. Um, 
so yeah, so I just close with that and then we'll do whatever we're doing next. So I'm just gonna find my note in my head. Lambs and doves, gifts of man, could never bring us back again. Lamb of God became a man. Your eyes on the Father, the kingdom descends. The curtain is torn, no longer outside. Embraced in the heavens to reign by your side. We sing with the elders surrounding the throne. Hearts now resolved, purified by the cold. We take the bread, we drink the wine in your presence, so oh God, we remember. We take. Oh, God. 
Connie's going to pray um, for divine interruptions in your life. How fun will that be? So, Father, we just thank you so much for today. Thank you for Teresa and for Connie for the boldness that they had to walk in obedience. Um, that you took them to places, Father, that, that were new and unfamiliar. And you reward them for their obedience. Thank you that you brought them both back here to Abbotsford, B.C. Thank you, Father. Thank you for specific answers to our prayers. Thank you for your protection. And uh, Father, stretch us. We bless you in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day.